Hello, AP Chem. I'm ready to do uh, the Chapter 17 notes. I have the first three sections finished. And so this will be a video of sections 17 1, 17 2, and 17 3. Our uh, Chapter 17 uh, sort of uh, feeds off of Chapter 6, which was um, our first thermodynamics chapter. It talked about uh, delta H or the change in enthalpy. Uh, this will be uh, discussing the change in free energy, which is the determiner of spontaneity or thermodynamic favorability. And uh, it'll also talk about uh, entropy and the role entropy plays in spontaneity. And uh, entropy being the disorder, um, the amount of chaos or disorder in a chemical system. So it's going to be uh, fairly abstract. We'll be thinking about molecules and uh, we'll be thinking about what are the aspects of those molecules that allow certain chemical changes to occur and not others. So to recall, the, um, the first law of thermodynamics uh, was important in chapter six, and that was that energy is not created or destroyed. The energy of the universe is constant. And um, this statement is uh, typically stated as the first law of thermodynamics. Now we know that even though energy is constant, forms of energy can be interconverted. You can take nuclear energy and generate electricity. You can take electricity and generate heat. You can take electricity and generate kinetic energy by using it to drive a fan or something like that. Um, electricity can be used to create, to create light. Um, chemical energy can create light. Light can be given off during a chemical reaction. Um, potential energy can be converted to kinetic. Kinetic can be converted to potential. If the person on the bike gets a little speed up, they can coast to the top of a hill. Uh, their kinetic energy decreases as they are coasting up the hill, but their potential energy is increasing. If they're on top of the hill, they have a high potential energy, but no kinetic energy until they push off, and then the potential energy decreases while the kinetic energy increases as they speed up going down the hill. So, um, and the campfire uh, shows that uh, the chemical energy in the wood can be converted into heat and light. Um, kinetic energy of the molecules uh, can come from the potential energy of the bonds in the wood. So, um, there are ways that energy can interconvert. Uh, in this chapter, we are kind of looking at not just how much energy is uh, converting in one form or the other, but rather... Um, how does the importance of those energy changes, um, what is the importance of those energy changes on uh, whether or not certain processes occur or not? Signs are going to be very important here. I, I wanted to show you there's a, a song that uh, you might hear me sing uh, this uh, next couple of weeks on the uh, about sign, 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 everywhere a sign. Uh, it was a band back in the 70s called the Five Man Electrical Band, first put it out. I believe there was a cover in the uh, mid-2000s or something. But anyway, um, uh, it may, I always think of this song when I think of this, uh, this topic of thermodynamics because the sign of the um, various uh, delta H or delta S or delta G, delta S being the uh, entropy and delta G being the uh, free energy changes. The signs are very important. So keep in mind as we go through this, um, the quantity of uh, heat and entropy and free energy are all important, but even more so important is their sign. So just to kind of summarize here right at the beginning, we're going to learn, um, as we did back in Chapter 6, that Delta H is positive when something is endothermic and negative when a process is exothermic. Delta S, the change in the entropy, is positive when the, when the uh, process increases disorder and negative when the process decreases disorder. So increasing disorder, more disordered, decreasing disorder, more ordered. Because you kind of have a double negative there. Uh, positive delta G would mean that the process is not what uh, thermodynamicists call spontaneous. Um, AP prefers to say not thermodynamically favorable. And a negative delta G or negative change in free energy means that it is favorable. 
Um, 17.1 is going to talk about spontaneous processes and the importance of entropy, but I think we first need to define what we mean by a spontaneous process. A spontaneous process are the types of processes that do not need help to occur. They occur without outside intervention. So these are the processes that are thermodynamically favored, the ones that um, are, are going to happen. You don't have to force them to happen. So a spontaneous party um, is not necessarily a quick party, but a spontaneous party does not require planning or preparation. A spontaneous party just breaks out. So in the same way, a, um, a process, a chemical process that does not need help to get start uh, to, to occur, it might need help to get started. It may have a high activation energy, minute, but it doesn't need help to occur it's naturally going to occur. So spontaneous processes are ones that naturally occur. Um, now they may be fast or slow. Uh, kinetics is not is different than thermodynamics. Kinetics is focusing on the pathway. Thermodynamics is focusing on one, the starting and the ending point. Are you lowering the energy by uh, doing the process? If so, then it's going to occur without intervention. But it may not occur quickly. Thermodynamics allows us to predict if the process is going to occur and how much energy we can get from doing it, but kinetics is going to tell us if it's a fast process or a slow process. So don't think that just because a process should occur that you'll necessarily see it happen right away. Um, it may be just that it's a slow process. Uh, De Beers, the company that sells diamonds, claims that diamonds are forever, but in fact, I don't think they thermodynamically can claim that because if you look at the thermodynamics of diamond and graphite, thermodynam uh, the thermodynamics says that a diamond should spontaneously change to graphite. However, because there's such a high activation energy, as seen in the graph on the right, to go from diamond to graphite, the process is very slow. So maybe it isn't forever, but it's for a very long time. Diamonds are going to stick around for a very long time uh, before they change to graphite. So the process is very slow, even though it's thermodynamically favorable or spontaneous. So if you think about these uh, reaction coordinate graphs, um, the area of the energy of the reactant and the energy of the product and whether the reactants or products have more energy, that's the domain of thermodynamics, the initial and the final states. It's how do you get from reactant to products? Do you include a catalyst and lower the activation energy? Do you do multiple steps? Is it a three-step mechanism or four-step mechanism? Are there intermediates? Are there, um, as I said, catalysts involved? Um, is it got a high activation energy? Does it have a low activation energy? What are the angles you have to collide at? What molecules need to collide? What's the slow step? That's all kinetics. That's all chapter 12. But the energy you start at and the energy you end at, that's thermodynamics. Now, further exploring this idea of spontaneity, or as AP Chemistry prefers us to call it, thermodynamic favorability, there are certain things that happen in the world that we know um, are the natural direction of their change. For example, if a ball is at the top of a hill, um, we expect it to roll down the hill naturally by gravity pulling it down the hill, but a ball sitting at the bottom of a hill is not expected to spontaneously roll up the hill. Uh, that would be very surprising to us if we saw a ball at rest at the bottom of the hill suddenly begin rolling up the hill because it would just be going counter to what we know is the natural direction of things. We know if exposed to air and moisture, steel rusts, and that is a spontaneous process. Um, however, iron oxide in rust doesn't spontaneously change back to iron, metal, and oxygen. Um, you're going to need some energy uh, you're going to have to supply some, uh, uh, you're going to have to force it back the other way before the um, uh, iron, metal, and oxygen are regenerated from the iron oxide. If you put a gas in a container, it fills out spontaneously throughout the container uniformly. It doesn't collect over on one side of the container. We wouldn't expect that to occur. We expect it to spread out because of the random nature of the motion of the molecules, we expect it to spread out uniformly. Uh, heat flow. 
We naturally see heat flow from a hot object to a cold one. We don't see cold objects giving heat to hot objects. It just doesn't happen. It's not the natural direction. So there are natural directions to things. Wood burns to make carbon dioxide and water. You can't just throw carbon dioxide and water together and expect them to turn into wood. Um, at temperatures, here's interesting, it could be temperature dependent. At temperatures below zero Celsius, water is going to spontaneous free, spontaneously freeze, or thermodynamically it's going to be favorable for water to freeze. But at temperatures above zero Celsius, the opposite process, ice is going to spontaneously melt. So there's there could be, and very often is, a temperature dependence on whether or not a process is spontaneous or not. And we'll talk about that uh, later in this uh, video. All right, so what is the driving force? What should we look at in a um, particular change to decide is this change going to be thermodynamically favorable or not? Can we just look at exothermic? Um, chemists early on thought maybe that exothermic is the determiner of thermodynamic favorability. Because um, as we know, a lot of reactions are exothermic. So maybe exothermic is it. But then we think about some exceptions to that. Ice melts uh, spontaneously above zero Celsius, but the melting of ice breaks bonds, which means it's endothermic. So there's an endothermic process occurring um, uh, spontaneously. So we can't say that it's just about being exothermic. So chemists have studied this, and they've come up with this particular um, uh, statement. The driving force for spontaneous processes is that they increase the entropy of the universe. We're going to see this as the second law of thermodynamics. The driving force for a spontaneous process is that those processes increase the entropy of the universe. Now, why would that make a difference? Why is the entropy of the universe an important thing? Um, well, we're going to kind of come at it from a statistics or probability point of view. Um, part of the why behind this is that disorder is more probable than order. Um, so the universe is sort of a lot of random events, but the ones that are more probable are the ones that are more likely to occur or the ones that are naturally what we're going to see. Uh, disorder is more probable than order. For example, um, if you take the cards out of a freshly bought um, box of uh, playing cards, you'll find that they are always in the same order. Uh, playing cards are always sold. I believe the ace of spades is on top and then the other aces, and they're always in order from ace, king, queen, and on down in the box. And uh, there's a certain order to them. There's one order that you always purchase them straight out of the box. But then you start playing with them, and you shuffle them, and you shuffle them, and you shuffle them. There are 52 factorial ways that a deck of 52 cards can be shuffled. There's one way it comes out of the box. There's 52 ways that it can be shuffled. Well, shuffling is creating disorder. And disorder is more probable than order. Um, there are more ways to, um, to have the cards shuffled. You would not expect... In fact, you would you would just be gobsmacked if, uh, to use a, uh, a phrase there that you wouldn't expect to hear in a chemistry lecture, but um, you would be gobsmacked if you shuffled the decks and somehow they came out to be exactly the same order as they come straight out of the box. There's only a 1 in 52 factorial chance that would happen. So we come to expect um, processes that increase disorder. So entropy is actually a thermodynamic function just like um, enthalpy. And it describes the number of arrangement or positions or energy levels that are available in a given system. Now to illustrate this idea of the number of possible ways to arrange something, let's go back to that idea of a gas filling up a container spontaneously. Let's say that we start with all the gas on one side in one bulb or sphere uh, container, and then we open the valve between the two sides 
what our expectation is, is that the gas is going to spread out uniformly or evenly on both sides of the, um, of the system, that both bulbs are going to have equal pressure and equal um, crowdedness of the, of the gas molecules, that they're going to spread out uniformly. Now, um, the chance of that occurring is that there's more chances that it's going to occur that way than for them all to gather on one side or the other. Now, to look at the possibilities here, um, let's consider maybe the simple system of two molecules. So we start in the upper left here. We've got two molecules on the right. We open the valve. There are four ways that this red and blue molecule can position themselves. There can be a blue and a, on one side and a red on the other, a red on one side and a blue on the other. We could have both on the, uh, on the right, we could have both on the left. And those are all equally probable because the gas molecules are moving randomly between the two sides. Now, if you notice here, there's only a 50% chance that the molecules are one on one side and one in the other. It's actually a 50% chance that if you had two, only two molecules, there'd be a 50% chance that they would be both in the same side of the container. But it's because we, we actually put billions and billions of molecules into these containers, into these um, um, two sides, that we typically don't see this occurring. For example, let's just increase from 2 to 4. If we increase from 2 to 4, as the uh, one on the left side lower here shows, there are, five, I believe it's 16, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 ways that four molecules can position themselves on two sides of the uh, system here. And notice of those 16, there's only a 1 in 8 chance that they're all on the left or all on the right. There's a 2 out of 16 chance. There's a um, 6 out of 16 chance that it's perfectly 2 and 2. And there's a, an 8 out of 16 or 50% chance that it's 3 and 1. Um, so we see that spreading out and um, evenly spreading out becomes more probable. Now this particular um, uh, arrangement becomes even more likely that you're going to be either 50-50 uh, on each side or nearly 50-50 on each side. Um, the probability is much greater when you have billions of molecules. Um, so what do we expect? We expect that if um, side A is, in a is a vacuum and side B has one atmosphere, that if you open the valve that it will spontaneously spread out uh, so that there's half an atmosphere on each side, assuming the bulbs are equal in size. And this is simply because that is the more probable way. The chance of all of them happening to be randomly on, all on one side and that side A or side, side B is going to be one atmosphere, it's just so infinitesimally small that it's just not going to occur. So what we're seeing here is that entropy is the more likely arrangement uh, disorder is the more likely arrangement, order is the less likely arrangement. Now the type of entropy we were just talking about is called positional entropy. Positional entropy is greater when you have a gas than when you have a liquid and greater for a liquid than a solid. Um, we'll say that S, the entropy of a solid, is less than the entropy of a liquid, and the entropy of a liquid is much less than the entropy of a gas. There's a lot more ways that the molecules can randomly arrange themselves in a gas than there is in a liquid, although a liquid is more disordered than a solid. Solids are typically crystalline. This also, positional entropy, entropy also plays a big part in the formation of solutions. Um, we, uh, we learned back in the chapter on, as we talked about solutions, that there's a, there's a natural tendency for things to mix. Um, and that's because there's more positional entropy when they mix than when they are uh, segregated into two parts, a solute and a, and a solvent. We see that with the salt and water in the lower pictures. Um, over time, as the salt dissolves, there are more positions available for the crystal ions of chloride and sodium in the solution than there are in the crystal. 
and there's just more disorder if you dissolve a solute in a solvent. Um, however, uh, we, we want to keep this in mind that what if I dissolve a gas in a solution? The gas actually has more entropy in the solution in the gas phase than it does in the solution. So the it may actually uh, switch around if you're going from the gaseous state to the aqueous state, your entropy might actually go down. There's more order in the liquid state than there is in the gaseous state. So keep that in mind as well. Let's do an example problem here just to try to uh, predict the sign of the entropy change for each of the processes. We would say, what is the sign of delta S? What is the sign of the change in entropy? And we're only looking here at positional entropy. Um, and let's say that we're doing it per mole at a, at a particular uh, given temperature. Solid carbon dioxide, dry ice, gaseous carbon dioxide, the gas carbon dioxide in the air after this dry ice sublimates. Um, I would say here that the solid carbon dioxide is more ordered, the gaseous carbon dioxide is more disordered, and since S is a measure of disorder, I would say delta S, or the change in entropy, would be positive for this uh, predictor change. N2 gas at one atmosphere and N2 gas at one times 10 minus two atmosphere, obviously um, N2 gas at one atmosphere is more crowded, there's less places in the system. N2 gas at 1 times n minus 2 atmosphere would be in a larger volume at a particular temperature. A mole of N2 gas at that low of a pressure would have to have a large volume. So the gas at a larger volume or a lower pressure is going to have more entropy. So um, the uh, higher positional entropy would be for N2. And if the gas at 1 atmosphere expanded to 1 times n minus 2 atmospheres, we would say that the delta S was positive. Um, so the sign of the entropy change, solid sugar added to water to form a solution. Uh, a solid sugar um, is more ordered than in a solution. So we would say that the entropy change here is positive. It's becoming more disordered. Iodine vapor condenses on a cold surface to form crystals. Well, in the vapor state, it had more disorder than when it goes to the crystal state. So delta S, or the sign of entropy change, would be negative in that case. So back to the second law of thermodynamics. Um, in any spontaneous, or as AP prefers to say, thermodynamically favored process, there's always an increase in the entropy of the universe. And so these two things are hand in hand. Increase in the entropy of the universe, spontaneous, thermodynamically favored. Um, Energy is constant, first law of thermodynamics. Entropy is increasing, second law of thermodynamics. Now remember, the entropy of the universe is the entropy of the change of the system plus the entropy change of the surroundings. Uh, we, uh, we learned this back in uh, chapter six, that when you talk about the universe, you have to talk about your, your particular system that you're studying plus whatever is around it. Um, those two together make up the universe. So if the entropy change of the universe is going to be positive to make the process thermodynamically favored, then if it's negative, then we would say it is not favored. So a positive change in the entropy of the universe is, is, a, is thermodynamically favored. Negative is not favored. But if we're going to learn the sign of delta S of the universe, we're going to have to consider the sign of delta S of the system and delta S of the surroundings. It's not just what's happening in the system, it's what's happening in the surroundings. Now you might be thinking, well, what's happening in the surroundings? So let's, uh, let's first look at what's happening in the system, though. Let's consider the change of state. One mole of water is our system, and it's currently a liquid, and it's going to change to a gas. So what's the entropy change of the system? Well, one mole of liquid water is 18 grams. And because water has a density of 18, uh, 1 gram per milliliter, that would be 18 milliliters. If we're, let's say, um, at the temperature where water boils, 100 Celsius, one mole of gaseous water at 100 Celsius, one atmosphere, using Pivner, works out to be 31 liters. So obviously there's a lot more space for this mole of, of water molecules in the gas phase than there is in the liquid phase. It's much more spread out, which gives it much more positional entropy, gives it much more uh, possible arrangements when it's on a larger volume. 
And so we would say that changing liquid water to gas has a positive delta S to the system. But now what is the entropy change of the surroundings? And why would the surroundings even be affected by um, liquid water changing to a gas? Well, I'm not going to attempt to prove it here. And people have uh, derived this um, uh, using some... Uh, uh, high-level thermodynamics uh, explanations, but suffice it to say that the thermodynamicists say the entropy change of the surroundings is due to heat flow. That is the only thing that the system can really do to the surroundings is change its uh, amount of heat. It can give heat to surroundings in an exothermic process. It can take heat from the surroundings in an endothermic process. So let's focus on that heat flow, and is heat being given to the surroundings, or is heat being taken from the surroundings? So if heat flows into the surroundings, or out of the system, in an exothermic process, it would increase the disorder of the surroundings, because it would speed up the molecules of the surroundings, and as they move more quickly, they move more randomly. So that's, that's the hand-waving attempt to explain why heat makes a difference here. Um, if heat flows out of the surroundings and in the system, then um, it will, uh, I think I've got this wrong here, I say decrease the disorder of the system. Um, I mean to say decrease the disorder of the surroundings. Let me get this fixed real quick here so it's right. So if heat flows out of the surroundings and into the system, it's increasing the entropy of the system because it's giving the system heat, but it's decreasing the disorder of the, system, of the surroundings. Got two periods in there. Um, so changing liquid water to gaseous water breaks the hydrogen bonds in the liquid water to form the gas. It's an endothermic process. So since it's an endothermic process, heat is going to flow out of the surroundings into the system, which is going to decrease the disorder of the surroundings, which is going to mean delta S surroundings negative. So all of that to come up with a conclusion that this process of liquid water changing to gaseous water has a positive delta S of the system and a negative delta S of the surroundings. Now remember, for it to be thermodynamically favorable, we want the delta S of the universe to be positive but it's a sum of a positive and a negative number. Well, whether or not delta S universe is going to be positive depends on whether delta S system is more positive or if delta S surroundings is more negative. So the sign of a positive plus a negative depends on which number is larger, uh, which has larger magnitude. Um, now thinking about this uh, process here, liquid water going to gaseous water, this is favorable above 100 Celsius but unfavorable below it. We know liquid water spontaneously or thermodynamically favorably changes to gas above 100 Celsius. Water vapor is the stable form above 100 Celsius, but liquid water is the stable form below 100 Celsius. So it appears that temperature, it plays a part here. Uh, it's not just um, the delta S, the system, and the surroundings and the heat flow. It's what temperature does that occur at seems to make a difference as well. So let's look at the effect of temperature. We don't expect the temperature to make a big difference in the delta S of the system. Because remember, the entropy change of the system is positional. Um, and that's not based on the kinetic energy of the particles. It's more based on the, the volume of the particles and the volume available for the particles to move about in. But we can make the argument that the, that the delta S of the surroundings, the entropy change of the surroundings, is temperature dependent. Now, it's just going to be kind of an analogy. If I gave $50 to a millionaire, the millionaire um, is not very much affected by that. It makes a lot less difference. If I give $50 to a homeless person, that makes a big difference. So the millionaire would be like high temperature. And giving heat to assist to a surroundings that are at high temperature makes a little makes very little difference because they already have a lot of heat. A little more heat doesn't make a big difference. 
But when your surroundings are cold, giving the heat to the surroundings makes a bigger difference. So the delta S, the surroundings where it's absorbing heat or, or um, giving heat to the system or um, taking heat out of the system, that's more important. That sign of delta S the surroundings and the size of delta S surroundings is greater at a low temperature and lower at a high temperature. So it turns out that um, at low temperatures, the delta S the surroundings becomes a major player at high temperatures, giving heat or taking heat from the surroundings has little effect. And so now we focus on delta S the system. So in the same way, heat flow makes a most impact when it's at low temperature. At low temperature, the negative change of entropy for the surroundings is more important. So, um, at low temperatures, the negative delta S of the surroundings gives us a negative delta S of the universe. The negative delta S surroundings outweighs the positive for the delta S of the system. So at low temperatures, the process is not favorable. But at high temperatures, when the delta S surroundings being negative is less important, the delta S system being positive outweighs it, and the delta S universe becomes positive. So at high temperatures, liquid water changes to gas that's thermodynamically favorable. At lower temperatures, below 100 Celsius, the change from liquid to gas is not favorable. So what have we learned so far? We've learned that the entropy change of the surroundings, the sign, depends on the direction of heat flow. So when the heat is flowing out of the system into the surroundings, delta S surroundings is positive. When the heat is flowing into the surroundings from the system, uh, or out, out of the surroundings into the system, delta S of the surroundings is negative. Um, so also we found that delta S surroundings depends on the magnitude of temperature. So to kind of summarize those, this is the math formula for it. Delta S surroundings equals negative delta H over T. Remember, delta H is positive for an endothermic process, for an endothermic process, heat flows out of the surroundings, and so delta S is negative when you have an endothermic process or positive delta H. Uh, the T is divided into it because at higher temperatures, we diminish or the delta S surroundings is less important. At higher temperatures, this factor is a smaller number. And then for an exothermic process, delta H is negative. Negative times a negative a negative of a negative is positive, and so we have a positive change in the entropy of the surroundings. But at higher temperatures, it's less, it's less important. At low temperatures, it's more important. So to calculate some um, uh, delta S of the surroundings here, uh, we got a couple of chemical reactions here in example 17.4, and their delta H's are given. And we want to know what the delta S surroundings would be for each of these reactions at 25 Celsius in one atmosphere. So the first one, we're remembering that delta S surroundings equals negative delta H over T. T needs to be in Kelvin. We have negative, negative 125 kilojoules over 298 Kelvin. 25 Celsius is 298 Kelvin. So that comes out to 0.419 kilojoules per Kelvin or as delta S's are usually given, I know this is confusing, delta H's are usually kilojoules, delta S's are usually given in joules, uh, 419 joules per Kelvin. For the second reaction, delta H is 778 kilojoules, so negative 778 kilojoules over 298 Kelvin comes out to negative 2.61 kilojoules per Kelvin, or negative 2.61 times 10 to the third joules per Kelvin. So just a reminder, exothermic is more important at low temperatures, more entropy for the system is more important at higher temperatures. So typically, exothermic goes with bond forming. We see bond forming being more important at low temperatures. Isn't that the nature of the world? At low temperatures, bonds form. At low temperatures, water freezes. At low temperatures, things solidify. Bonding is more important at low temperatures. 
at higher temperatures, things tend to fly apart and become very disordered. Um, as kinetic energy increases, we tend to get more bonds breaking. So more entropy for the system is what's important at higher temperatures. And that's because that interplay between delta as a system and delta as surroundings. Now, if you happen to get a process, and there's, these are possible, that you could have delta as a system be positive and delta as a surrounding be positive, you know the process is going to be spontaneous because a positive plus a positive will always equal a positive. So delta as the universe will be positive and the process will be thermodynamically favorable. If you have a negative delta S system and a negative delta S surroundings, delta S universe cannot help but be negative. That is a process that will never occur at any temperature. If you have a positive delta S system, but a negative delta S surrounding, this is only going to be positive for the universe if delta S system is more important. And that would be true at higher temperatures because you divide by temperature to get delta S surroundings. And dividing by a bigger number makes it smaller. So at a high temperature, this process would be spontaneous, but at a lower temperature, it would not. And then for a negative delta S system and a positive delta S surrounding, now we want a low temperature so that the delta S surroundings can be most important. Um, and so at a, um, um, a low temperature, this is going to be more important. Okay, so there's the end of those notes, and I'll get those posted to um, the YouTube.